Okay, so for today's video, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, I was checking out my channel analytics and I was in the audience section and I was just kind of seeing what it shows me here. So it shows me that a good 70% of my viewers are from the US, 15% are from Israel, then we got the UK, good old Canada, <laughs> number four. And then 0.5% from Australia. I think this is my boy Mendel. <laughs> um, and after seeing this kind of breakdown, uh, I thought, why don't I check out what the differences are? And somebody had recommended this channel Unpacked when I started looking at like Israel and Palestine. Um, and they just released this about a month ago. And it says... I'm not really looking forward to this question. Like, I'm not looking for the answer for, like, the real Jew. That doesn't matter to me. I just kind of wanted to see the differences between some of these. So, uh, yeah. Well, let's just get into it. In America, if someone is picturing a Jew, it's almost always an Ashkenazi one. And that's because of the roughly 7 million Jews in America, only about... Okay, 7 million... 5.5 million are Ashkenazi. This is in America. Wow. Okay. About half a million aren't Ashkenazi, but that's not true across the world. Sorry, in hold on. Let me go back just a second. What, what does this he say? Ashkenazi one. And that's because of the roughly 7 million Jews in America, only about half a million aren't Ashkenazi. But that's not true across the world. In Israel, the majority of Jews are not Ashkenazi. Okay, so the majority of Jews in Israel are Sephardic Jews and Mizrahi, Mizrahi, and then other Jewish groups. Okay, I mean Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews, they look pretty close. And yet most Americans don't know the first thing about other types of Jews, specifically Sephardic culture. So in no particular order, here are five surprising differences between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. Okay. The, the only things that I know so far is that like Sephardic Jews are kind of more uh, Spain, Portugal, I think somebody had said. That's kind of like where they originated from. Before getting into the list, a quick review of who these two groups are. Ashkenazi Jews originally came from Germany, France, and Eastern Europe, while okay. Sephardic Jews originally came from Portugal and Spain, and later lived... Okay, all right, so, wow, look at all these. Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mag Maghrebi, or Berber. Mizari, uh, Mizari. Wow, that's a lot. Bag, Bagdada, Dadi is India. Holy smokes. Beta Israel and Bene Israel. What is Beta Israel? Hmm. In all of these places, notably, there's a lot of overlap in who lived where. Okay, so this is like uh portugal spain a little bit of italy is this morocco down here i think and not all jews neatly fit into these two categories not by a long shot mizrahi jews for instance are largely from the middle east and they share many customs with the sephardic jews so that's how you say mizrahi got you they're more middle eastern jewish jews okay so much so that in Israel, many think of them as one group. And then there are Ethiopian Jews, Italkim, and many others. But in America, these are the two biggest groups of Jews. And living in these separate areas created many differences beyond just the shade of the color of their skin. Number one, the food. Bagels, matzo ball soup, gefilte fish, kugel, all Ashkenazi. Kugel. Okay, so I like the kugel. Yeah, a lot of people were saying that the uh, the Sephardic food is a lot different than, than the Ashkenazi food. They come from countries where Ashkenazi Jews used to live, and they're still served in those countries under different names. 
That gefilte fish looks a lot better than the one we saw in that video. Think cold weather Eastern European fare. Arafina, shakshuka, mufleta, all Sephardic. Coming from warmer countries, they're often more colorful and might actually be spicy. In other words, both groups have taken on and adapted dishes from the countries where they lived. There are foods that both groups eat, such as variations of challah and sholand, but even those can look mm. quite different. And in Yeah, so we did see there was two different types of sholand in that video, but I think that one was a Polish sholand, so I guess that wouldn't really fall under, under that category. Importantly, both groups have a long tradition of keeping kosher, the Jewish dietary rules. But even within that, there are notable differences. On the holiday of Passover, for instance, while neither eat bread, Ashkenazi Jews also don't traditionally eat kidney oat, which includes all of these. It makes for very different dishes. Whoa, this guy's going real fast in this video. What the heck was all that? So don't traditionally eat kidney oat, which... Are those like beans? Beans, buckwheat, caraway, cardamom, corn, edamame, fennel seeds. So why, why during Passover would they not eat legumes? Does that have something to do with like separation of grain and, and whatnot? Grain and seed maybe? I don't know. Includes all of these. It makes for very different dishes at the Seder. It also means that on Passover, there are some Ashkenazi Jews who aren't able to eat at Sephardic Jews' houses if both are traditionally observant in their own way. Jews can go their entire life without realizing there's a whole other variety of Jewish recipes that they didn't know existed and look nothing like the dishes they grew up with. Number two, the prayers and music. The prayer services of both groups have the same structure and greatly overlap in terms of wording. But even though most of the wording is the same, the melodies are quite different. Here's an Ashkenazi one. This is what we're used to, or at least what I'm used to. And here's a Sephardic one. Elements of the synagogue, such as how the seats are arranged, are also quite... So the synagogue... So Turkey, Morocco, Netherlands, Germany, Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam and Netherlands. Different. You can even hear the cultural influences and in popular music in Israel through the years. Many of the Israeli folk songs come from Ashkenazi tunes. <laughs> And today, Israeli pop music has a lot of Sephardic and Mizrahi influences. Oh, uh, some people are not going to watch it after this part. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the Orthodox Jews. I wasn't aware that they would be singing and dancing in this, but... Number three, the languages. Yiddish, which combined Hebrew with German, was only spoken by Ashkenazi Jews. So they were the ones busy noshing and kvetching. What chutzpah? Sephardic Jews had a variety of other languages, including Ladino and Chakitiya, which, in part, combined Hebrew and Spanish. So Ladino, Haberes Buenos. Yeah, that's, that's the Spanish mix, eh? El Dioti Hadid di Malos. Caminos. Hmm. To name just a couple of the many languages. Both Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews continued to maintain Hebrew, but even there they had different ways of pronouncing certain letters and words. Many learned Hebrew in order to both pray and to understand the holy texts, like the Torah. These days, both sides mostly speak the language of the country where they're living. Number four, the laws and traditions. Jewish laws go all the way back, predating the split between the Ashkenazi and Sephardic communities. So they share many of the same laws. The general rules around kosher and Shabbat, for instance. Hmm. But for So kosher, Shabbat, holidays, marriage, prayer, mourning, and modesty. Okay. Hundreds of years, even if there was always some communication between the two sides, the two groups developed independently. 
At one point in the 1500s, it was incredibly difficult to sort through and understand which exact Jewish laws to follow. So at roughly the same time, both the Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities started working on collecting their own set of rules into one place. So, is he gonna pronounce these? For a while, neither side realized the other. No. So, Darshe Moshi and Biet Yosef? The other side was simultaneously working on a similar project. When the rabbi on the Ashkenazi side realized that he was writing a competing book rather than creating two separate law books, he decided that he'd instead write an add-on for the book recently published on the Sephardic side called the Shulchan Aruch that called out the variations between the Sephardic and Ashkenazi traditions. And it meant that in most cases, they could share the same set of rules. Here's just a couple of examples. Wait, what? So they already shared the same set of rules, but then they were creating two books to show the difference of them, but then it came back to say that they could share the same? Is that what he just said? They could share the same set of rules. Here's just a couple of examples of the many rules and customs, minhagim, that are different between the two groups. Sephardic Jews will name a child after a living relative, whereas Ashkenazi Jews will only name a kid after someone who has passed away. Also, Ashkenazi Torahs look like this, and Sephardic Torahs look like this. At weddings, only Sephardic brides... So, is the difference just the size? Because I feel like we've seen some of the other Torahs in the Ashkenazi videos that were small like this, no? ...traditionally get henna, and it's only Ashkenazi brides who circle the groom seven times. We can make a whole top five list of just different wedding traditions. Number five, the movements. This difference is more abstract, getting to the very heart of who these two groups are. Most often, when Americans think about the different types of Jews, it has to do with the denominations, such as Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox. But this separation between the movements only happened on the Ashkenazi side. The reform movement splitting off from traditional Judaism was, in part, influenced by the Protestants recently splitting off from the Catholics. Interesting. Okay. Again, I don't know how true any of this is. Um, I don't know if this is more, you know, what, what the, the basis of this channel is, but a lot of people recommended I check out Unpacked because they said that they do a lot of stuff on, the, on this, so... Hopefully a lot of this information is correct. To Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, they had no such reference point. They developed in a completely different manner. To quote Micah Goodman, the movements and counter-movements that complicated Jewish identity in Europe barely touched Jews in the Muslim world. While Jews faced serious troubles under both Christian and Muslim rule, only one of those sets of circumstances led to a division between Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox Jewry. The influence of local environments, then, went beyond what people wore or what Jews ate. It colored the very way in which they saw the world. Today, these are not two groups geographically isolated from each other. There's a lot more interaction between the two. For instance, when Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews marry each other, they have to choose which family customs to follow. And it oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's kind of similar to most... Uh... Well, I wouldn't say religious aspects, because I don't... Well, maybe there are... There are more than normal interfaith couples now like jews and catholics or stuff like that but maybe if you're like a really heavy practicing jewish person or like orthodox and you would never do that unless they were also in interacting and discussing these unique differences the jewish people continue to grow together despite the many differences both sides share a core connection to the rest of the Jewish world. There's something special so many Jews feel when they meet other Jews elsewhere in the world. It allows a traveler to jump into a local Jewish community in another country, excited to find a synagogue or hear Hebrew, even if it's quite different.
That reminds me of like um the Mayan man video that we watched where like I think it was Alabama he had just pulled up into and right away like he ran into another Jewish guy and like they bonded instantly kind of thing. From what they're used to. The difficult question that remains is what does it mean to be part of one people? And what will it take to all keep growing together? Interesting. Big Jewish ideas unpacked. Jewish Messiah. Jews versus Muslims. Oh man, I feel like this channel you could go down through a rabbit hole with this kind of information. I felt like it covered a lot of things and it gave you quite a bit of information, but it also kind of, I feel like, glossed over the very basic of all, all those things. I might have to check out another video of theirs, but I, I enjoyed that. Very interesting. Um, as always, you guys let me know if you agree or disagree with this video. Um, like I said, a lot of you guys are from the U.S., so I think majority of my viewers are Ashkenazi Jews. Then we have the Israeli Jews. Um, and then, like I said, we got my boy Mendel over here, keeping Australia strong. Um, also, yeah, male and female, like, and the... Uh, the age demographics, too. Pretty cool stuff that YouTube shows you here. And I'm actually pretty happy with this. The subscription rate. Obviously, would I would like it if it would be a little bit higher than 50% subscribed. But uh, I know a lot of channels that have maybe like 15 to 20% subscribed. So, thank you as always. Really, really do appreciate it. Like I said, I think we're almost at 5,000 subs. So, um... Like, comment, subscribe, and uh, I'll catch you guys on the next one.